Matt, good afternoon. How are you? Afternoon. How are you? Yeah, not bad at all. Thank you very much. Not bad on a Friday. How, how has this week been treating you? A nice sunny day outside. Let's be on the computers. Uh, is it, well, actually, where, where are you based today? Where are you based? So I'm on the outskirts of uh, Chippenham and in the southwest of uh, the UK. Our offices, our main offices pre-COVID, um, were open in Swindon. So that's where our HQ is. So, well, actually, t- f- funny you mentioned the sun because we've had the sunshine. I'm based here in London, literally, uh, Zone 3. We've had the sun yeah. for the past few days. Today has been the gloomiest day in a while. So actually, I don't, I'm not regretting being behind the screen, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing for you, <laughs> Friday, sunny behind the screen. I can't, I can't say anything. I'm sorry. It's tough. Yeah, I, I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. That's all I can it. say. <laughs> I, can't, I feel for you. I feel for you. But at least it's Friday. You have the weekend. It is yes, going to be sunny. Absolutely. We can be out. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, look, um, Matt, uh, you are the head of data analytics at Apps Broker. Do you want to tell our listeners, um, just give a bit of an introduction to who, who, who you guys, Apps Broker, who are you guys? So Apps Broker, we've been around 15 years. Um, I've been with Apps Broker uh, for about three and a half years um, now. Um, Apps Broker started out selling um, Google Workspace solutions or G Suite as it was formerly known. And obviously as uh, BigQuery and the other tool sets came into GCP, uh, we became a premier partner and then we became, uh, we sat on the board um uh, the decision board with google um and it was founded by uh, mike connor who uh, owns apps broker and now we're a managed service provider so that's we're the biggest msp in the uk uh which makes us one out of uh, 29 in the world um so and we've grown substantially so we're well over 100 uh, in the uk and we have an offshore um arrangement with uh, Romania where we've got our business as usual and they also uh, burst uh, c- capability onto projects so and we've got about 60 or 70 over in um, Romania so we're a significantly uh, quite a big partner with Google and our main solutions um, that we take everyone from a journey from uh, Greenfield on-prem straight up to GCP and then take them on that cloud maturity cycle and uh, as a consequence along the way we we deal with uh, a lot of leading customers in the verticals um, some of which are publicly known some of them are not but uh, pretty much in every vertical we tend to deal with the the leading uh, companies in those sectors so basically you're, you're not only are you quite um uh what's the word um experienced and, and a veteran in this in this uh, in, the, in this industry but you've also been partnering up with google since the very get-go as as a company yeah and it goes a long way uh google Google like to use Apps Broker. We'd like to say, A, because we're purple. Um, you know, that goes there. Why not? It worked for Prince, so it works for us. So um, they also like it because we're, we're a delivery partner. And what that really means is we actually make things happen. We actually deliver the solutions. There's a lot of failed cloud projects and a bit like dentistry everyone's got like a bad story to tell about it oh, yeah. so you know <laughs> yeah. and there's a there's a great difference between sort of saying and that's why google will like the way that we will treat our customers with a lot of respect we've got a lot of enthusiasm we're very passionate about cloud um and google themselves like to trust us for that reason um and in the end google want people to get onto gcp you know, that's what they're in the business for. So, um, you know, when it comes to it. So, again, we're, uh, we work very tightly with Google. So we're often alongside Google in joint propositions to certainly larger customers. Um, and, yeah, again, it's, uh, it's something that we pride ourselves in doing, really. Okay. So let's, let's, let's talk about that then. This is, this is, at the end of the day, what we're here to talk about. GCP versus AWS versus Azure. Now... Some might say, well, actually, it's a bit ironic that you've got uh, a GCP expert, really, to, to, to talk about that conversation, to, to you know, discuss that with. But it is appropriate, actually, that we do. So you've jumped chip into Apps Broker. You weren't really, as far as I know, and we discussed before, you weren't really a GCP expert prior to joining Apps Broker. No. So I'd worked on AWS. I, predominantly, I'd worked on IBM through IBM Business Partners for many years. Um, so... Uh, working on WebSphere and DB2, AS400 and the um, and uh, Lotus Notes, although let's let's not get let's not mention that 
that product set. We're not going to go into it. We're not gonna I go did all right on Lotus Notes. It worked for me for a bit. I'm not saying it's a great product, but it, 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 it helped me in my, uh, in my consultancy career. So, um, uh, and then I hadn't worked on it before. I, I tactically, uh, I wanted to join at Spreaker. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm local to the area. And it was as close to working for Google as, uh, as I could get. And, um, and I was interested in GCP. And at the time, GCP was fairly, fairly well established. I mean, BigQuery was well established, but it was obviously, they had a reputation for sort of staying, everything staying in beta for a long time. And at that turning point, they had then, uh, everything was hitting GA on a much regular cycle. And their uh, data capability um, and the tool sets that they were bringing out you know, were really phenomenal at a very fast pace. And that I always find interesting. My background is applied statistics, so I'm, I'm interested in data, I always have been. Uh, but I want things that are effectively, we don't want to analyze data for the fun of it, we actually want to do something practical with it. So I'm more interested in that wider consumption piece of data, which is hopefully slightly more than a dashboard, although they have their place, there are lots of things we can do with data. And uh, GCP, uh, other cloud providers clearly are available, and I am very partisan, as you'd expect. Um, it gives, uh, it was just interesting. And at the time, Google, as you know, um, is the third uh, largest cloud provider in the UK. They account for about 15% of the marketplace. So it's a half full, half empty type approach. So in terms of, I thought AWS was a bit crowded, um, and it seemed an IBM cloud is effectively IBM, you know, it's effectively running on your own cloud. Yeah. So it's not really that in that sense. Azure is everywhere, you know, so it goes without saying. So GCP looked like a really interesting platform. And of course, everything on GCP is open source. So you instantly get transferable skill, whether GCP is going to be around or not. So that was really my sort of very clinical decision uh, making, really. And, um, and I like the idea that, you know, we put in exciting solutions for customers. Uh, and a lot of that is about just moving the dial. And I think uh, on that, during my time, at least for the last three years, Google, uh, under TK's leadership, has become very t focused on enterprise level. And so you've got enterprise grade built in and you've got enterprise tooling that, that comes on the platform. And that makes it significantly uh, more attractive, particularly if, you, if you're building that kind of grade of solution. There's a lot more you need to consider, you know, obviously if we're productionizing uh, solutions to an enterprise, like a tier one bank, for example, we need, you know, CMEC, you know, we're gonna need customer managed encryption keys across the piece on top of the default Google encryption. And that's baked into the system, makes a big difference. Okay, so here's, here's, here's the thing then, let's, 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 then, let, let, let's dive into it. We know why you moved now, we understand why you moved. You, you've obviously experienced, like you said, AWS, the IBM, GCP now. For, you know, for companies who are looking to get on that, mm. okay, let's just say companies that don't know, we'll talk about the size as well at the same time uh, in a bit, but AWS, Azure, and GCP, other than the market share, um, other than how uh, popular they are, yeah. As far as functionality is concerned, there's not really much between them, is there? No, I mean, and that's the truth of it, that any large enterprise would have a multi-cloud solution. You know, I mean, it's very common, like for example, if you're running AD, you're gonna be on Azure, you're gonna have all your, usually your, your, your Active Directory services um, will be managed on Azure. You may have AWS in there and, and obviously GCP and some, aspects of each cloud is better than the other. The clever part is, is to know which ones you should be running uh, and what your NFRs are around that. So if it's cost driven, if it's speed driven, if it's tactically where your data strategy is and you want to then integrate with different tooling, um, then you can then sort of hang off each one. And in more recent times, obviously Google acknowledged this because they have products like Anthos, which is containerized uh, execution of uh, of products which you can run on you consuming multi-cloud or you have like BigQuery Omni. So you can then query AWS, say consumables or even Azure consumables, but put that workload onto BigQuery, that type of thing. So there's lots of different things you can do. And of course, tactically, uh, some things might be cheaper than others. In general, BigQuery, in my opinion, is still the jewel in the crown of GCP, an enterprise grade data warehouse 
that can search over petabytes of data for relatively cheap sums of money. And obviously there's lots of their billing and the account management side of things. So you can do pre-commits, you can do slots, you can do lots of different things to then, uh, and you can do cost control models as well. And you can obviously, you can do that on AWS and other ones, but it's all very easily managed um, in GCP. And I think that's that's really where we will take people onto a, uh, certainly organizations onto a journey to make sure that, you know, we're not amassing tech debt or we're making incorrect decisions um, and it addresses what they need in terms of scalability. But the joy of the cloud is, you know, you either use it or lose it. And that's the whole point of it, isn't it? That if we want to spin up and consume vast amounts of data, I don't want to pay for that pipeline when it's not being used. And so whatever cloud solution you do, it's how you approach it. And what we feel is, is that GCP offers uh, quicker, faster, and more scalable solutions. That's our opinion, of course. Do you see then, as a, from a product perspective, do you, do you see GCP as a threat to AWS and Azure because it's going to come here, it's going to you know, kind of take over really? Or is this more or less the limitations of how far it can go? Is, this, is the market just saturated people, that's it, this is the market share, GCP is the third, Azure is the second, AWS is the first, and that's how it's going to stay? I think the truth of it is, is that there's a lot of people still on-prem. And there's a lot of lots of organizations with significant amounts of data that haven't moved it to the cloud, which is why the market shares have led fairly static. But when we think about some of the more public commitments, so like Vodafone have chosen GCP uh, for their provider, Lloyd's have chosen it, HSBC are heavy consumers of uh, GCP and big commits going forwards. You know, there's a, there's a significant reason for that. And they, these, these journeys, these are long journeys to decommission what are, you know, data centers. And if you could imagine owning a data center and the cost of running that data center versus a five nines, you know, SLA out of the box from BigQuery, let's say. Um, I mean, obviously the other providers will give you that. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's exclusive to, to BigQuery, but it's just ready to go out of the box. And you don't need a data center and it and it and expandable to limitless levels um, is very attractive, you know, and I think that's part of why there will be a shift where I think the gaps will get closer and, and eventually it will become more about cloud to cloud migrations as opposed to on prem to cloud migrations. And I think that's the transition you'll see. But there's a lot of work from on prem to get up into the cloud in the first place. And I think that's that's something it's, it's relatively an untapped area you know because it's just cloud adoption and and uh, so, you know there's lots of many reasons why people haven't moved to those so basically what you're telling me is um that the the competition now is going to be for those who haven't really moved to the cloud as in those who have already moved they're more or less settled if you're with gcp if you're with aws if you're with azure you're not really going to change that now it's about gaining is the new clients who haven't really moved in this is where... I think it's a, yeah, absolutely. I, it's a nuanced message, right? Because if you've already been up in the cloud, you know all the great benefits of, of, of cloud and why you would use the cloud. Obviously, the cloud without controls can be an expensive place to play, for sure. So you need to have all the controls and all the things that you need. It needs to be secure and it needs all those kind of things that you would expect to have on, on, a, on a data strategy or certainly a provision of a network. But the other side of it is, is that you find that those people who already have taken benefit in the cloud and are not necessarily on GCP, they can think about either migrating off or they can do multi cloud solution where they realize that we could take tactically, we can move this workload is cheaper to run in GCP for this particular reason. And that data science run on Databricks is better to be run into Azure because it's cheaper. And, the, and orchestrating all of that and organizing it is where the smarter companies will be. Because the game is to get your operational cost as low as possible. That's what you're trying to do, unless you're directly monetizing what you're, what you're, what you're uh, analyzing. And at that point, you're trying to open out your margin anyway. So I think, I think you get this, and this is all to do with the cloud maturity cycle. The, the further up the maturity, the more uh, advanced you can then play, but there are real gains to be had. Because, you know, some of these workloads are significantly, I mean, some of these things are big. Storage is relatively trivial. Storing data where within compliance of, say, things like GDPR. But 
storing of, of long, long hit data, you, you have to go some to rack up a bill on storage, you know, uh, in that sense. So it's more about how you analyze this and how you process compute, you know, and the smarter way of doing that. And then when you're not using it, you then just tear it down and use it on demand, spin up, you know, using infrastructure as code and then consume it and then put it down again. Um, that's something that, that obviously if you're on-prem, you can't even contemplate doing things like that. Not easily. So would you, would you, would you say there's a, you know, given how closely matched the services you guys provide, the GCP, uh, not, not obviously the GCP, which is what you guys provide, but uh, the GCP, AWS, and Azure. Is there a particular clientele, certain client base that you would feel this would, uh, GCP would be most attractive to them based on this offering? So arguably what Google do best is data. And so therefore, if, if it's uh, compute only, if it's VM migrations and things like that, there's a business for VMs. VMs can be imaged and run anywhere, if you like, you know, on any cloud provider you want. The actual consumption and storage of data, which can be separated from those, notably, um, that's where Google, I think, excels. And D Google has always been good at data. It's always come out with innovative product, products and it's able to process data. It's secure um, and safe, which is obviously very important. Um, and there are many different ways you can approach um, your billing around data because obviously it does cost money, right? Absolutely. So for the, for the that's less where I think perhaps, the division really is. For, for, for the less uh, technical, perhaps, or, you know, um, yeah. who don't have as much technical knowledge, the fact that, as you said, it's open source, sometimes the word open source can scare some people, especially when it comes to something as big as their data. So, you know, the AWS has a long standing community. Okay, they will yep. tell you, well, they might think, okay, well, it's actually probably more secure for us. But how can you please go into the fact that, yes, it's open source, but it's not really insecure, it is safe. Yeah, so a, a lot of, I mean, uh, m nearly all of the ecosystems around, say, the cloud SDKs, for example, these are hardened, uh, pen tested, systems and libraries that are used and obviously the language whether languages are more secure or another is a is a completely different debate which many people will argue for hours about but let's just say that for certainly on uh, google side some of their more proprietary technologies will support things uh, mainly java python but if you go into cloud functions which i suppose would be the aws equivalent would be lambda you can then start doing golang if you want to use that you could use node there's lots of different languages around. These are using established uh, frameworks. These are open source, as you say. Um, and I think the real key of that is, is that obviously open source is transferable skill. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's insecure or unsecure, I suppose. Um, I think what it means is, is that there's a wider pool of support and it's less proprietary to the platform you're on. Arguably, if you're on other cloud providers, if you like, um, those are very proprietary so it's very locked in and it's very difficult and you see this often with etl tooling some some etl tools are very locked in and closed um it just means support is very difficult it means that you're almost on the hook to that vendor to be able to get support and it makes a big difference to i think how fast you can develop things and i think that's the other part of it that um you know the speed in which you can move utilizing the cloud as an accelerator we can take 24 month projects and turn them into three into four month you know landing zones is is radically changing the dial and i suppose part of a, that language adoption covers that as well these are standard kind of two this is standard tooling this is standard approaches and obviously a lot of it is repeatable so you know i think in that sense that's that's why i think it's very attractive the flip side is of course you know a lot of every component in uh, GCP is an API. So you can consume it either front end, you know, through your console, if that's what you want to do. And the rest of it is all API services. Um, and therefore it's very easy to integrate. If you want to integrate two components together, really easy. And of course, if we're using third party components, for example, Salesforce APIs, integrating those into landing that into GCP, it's just an API feed. So there's lots of different sort of aspects to that. And again, I think that's the common building blocks that for certainly software engineering, 
is what you'd expect to be consuming and using. You're just using API services all the other side. And as I referred to earlier, you know, we're not always going to consume data through um, through a dashboard. You know, we can we can no, prop course. up a REST API service and then you can consume it that way or your suppliers can consume it securely and so on. Okay. I'd like to go down a, a, a certain point. Now, it's, and, and this is something we've discussed uh, uh, offline previously. You were telling me how, you know, you guys over the years have actually been growing. So what I'd like to know, and maybe it might be interesting for our listeners to know as well, how is it that you're growing when the, you know, the, the GCP market share hasn't really been changing? Um, so <laughs> that's quite an interesting paradigm, but I think ultimately um, it's to do with that the, the, the market is huge. The demand is massive. So, and this, this migration to cloud, whichever cloud, is a huge old train that everyone's jumping on. And so it couldn't be underestimated that it's, it's small gains, right? So 1% increase in that market is a huge amount of work in terms of data engineering, in terms of moving data and, uh, and so on. So a lot of this is all to do with that um, our growth is all to do with the interest that Google gets and how they then in turn use trusted delivery partners to uh, go and talk to those customers and hopefully deliver them some GCP solutions. So the Google are seeing an, an incredible increase in interest in their, uh, their product set from big enterprise customers. And obviously, if you can imagine, you know, if you're a Lloyd's, which is a publicly is a well-known committer to GCP, moving all of the all of that data up into GCP is a big transformation program, you know. But obviously for them, it's big gains. I mean, it's big savings, you know, which is and also they're trying to modernize at the same time. This is the whole point. You know, we don't want to lift and shift things. We just want to we want to be able to modernize as we go. So those kind of programs of work drive a lot of uh, a lot of demand, a lot of interest. And as I say, eventually, I think the numbers will will settle out uh, where I think you'll get some people who will do, you know, whole data centers being moved up will will obviously increase the percentage, depending on how you're measuring it, of course. So our listeners, okay, the Silicon Roundabout listeners, those who listen to the Silicon Roundabout podcast, uh, tech professionals, mostly, or let's just say the opposite, very few of them actually are GCP professionals. Very few of them are. So most of them are experts in AWS, uh, have worked in AWS environments, uh, or even Azure. Those who are listening now, from, from, from what you're saying now, yes, it sounds like GCP is here to stay. We are growing. The game is, we're not really taking, the competition isn't about taking each other's customers. It's about taking the new customers who will get on board. Yep. Um, and you know that's where the market share will start to play about. And given how the products are so very similar, if those listening are not GCP experts, why should they, you know, decide to, okay, it's probably worth learning GCP. It's probably worth adding that to my uh, area of expertise. Well, so I suppose there's one way of looking at it is to say that depending on what your skill set on AWS is, because obviously that's very wide, right? But let's assume you're a typical data engineer and you're doing or you're doing DevOps, right? So you're doing infrastructure as code. So you're using standard kind of deployment tools like uh, you know, Terraform and things like that. The, the way to look at it is, is that the skills that you already have transfer by and large over straight over to another cloud platform. And again, it's about having more skills. Um, you can carry that skill and experience into another platform. And if that platform is perceived as being popular, um, in, you often get data gravity, by which I mean, if you're putting data up into, let's say, uh, BigQuery, it's being landed up there, the gravity of that data, everything then follows. So your analytics follows, it will just be on the same platform. So what the, I think you'll find is the reason why it's interesting to go to that point is, is that if more and more data is kind of going up into GCP, you tend to find that all the workloads and all the extra things that go with it will tend to follow. And that's probably part of the attraction. The jump from moving from, say, an AWS to GCP is not as big as perhaps people think it is. Um, and it means that if it doesn't work out, you've learned some more <laughs> open source skills. Uh, 
you can transfer around and you can then obviously apply your multi-cloud knowledge because most people will have a multi-cloud solution. You can apply that, but obviously in a GCP world, which in most cases is open source anyway. So it's an interesting sort of area to take a view on. And as I say, where GCP occupies is the third largest. It's not going to be the third for a long, you know, it's not going to stay third. I mean, eventually our view is, is that, that it will it will become by virtue of the fact that it's storing a lot and lot of data, we think it will have uh, a lot more um, services will effectively expand up onto GCP for that reason. So from a career perspective then, from a career security, because that's essentially what the listeners will be thinking, okay, well, you know, uh, is, is if, if I'm to go down the GCP route, yep. uh, am, I, am I gonna end up being jobless basically, especially the entry level people, or not necessarily entry level, but the junior, Persons who haven't really established um, their expertise in AWS or Azure, they're yet to establish that. Um, is GCP the right first step, perhaps, or would you say it's more of a second step? First I think step? it's an enabler. You can join at any level. And so, for example, we've got senior data architects who came from an AWS background. Um, they certified within about three, four weeks, and they're they're transferring that knowledge, and they're and then they're away onto. Uh, GCP solutions as a data architect for our customers. So, you know, a, a lot of it is all to do with our approach to it and then knowing which components to be, which are correct and to put in for the customers. For data engineers, you know, GCP tends to be quite attractive in as much that um, it's quick and easy to get things built and done. And there's lots of things that we don't have to consider because obviously a lot of it is production ready. Um, that is then very interesting because if you want to get involved in things that actually go into production are hardened up and used in a, in an enterprise setting then um, you tend to and it's less like a tool you know it's less like a product if you like um, then uh, you can join that at any level and mostly of course people come in at different stages but normally they come from the data background so they would have done like a they would have done data analytics or data pipelines and the speed of which you can then onboard data, have that regularly being updated, store it into, you know, uh, whichever whichever one you want, mainly usually uh, BigQuery or you want some high frequency uh, data access through Bigtable, that type of thing. All of that is very easy and quick to build. So if if at the end of it you want to build complete end to end solutions, then it's very attractive because it's just easy to do. And obviously that means in a customer situation, um, we can give, we can show value very quickly, which is the game. We know why you went down the uh, yeah. GCP route. We know why you ended up joining Apps Broker, the local side, the, the interesting side. You know, why should uh, some of our listeners, for example, reach out to Apps Rock and say, look, uh, uh, you, oh, wow, you seem to be hiring. I'm, I'm interested in being involved with you guys. I'd like to join you. Be what, what's so special? Well, <laughs> so, so Apps Broker, um, we're not a big consultancy house. We, we, we like dealing with customers. We like our friendly approach. We're enthusiastic about cloud in that sense. And GCP is on a journey. And GCP, I mean, only this week has released three significant data products that they keep releasing on they're releasing more and more bi products so there's a journey that they're doing there's obviously lots of advances in devops which is less my specialism i may point out so um it, it's there's an exciting journey and customers are going on a journey so those two things put together are a very heady mix towards we can really transform a company and if that's what motivates you if that's what you want to do um, and you want to see customers you know, some of our customers through our tooling improved their peak trading by 40%, a significant amount. You know, their, their understanding of, of data and their, their insights they're getting in real time and making those kind of decisions, data-driven decisions is significant. And behind all of that, which is actually a very simple kind of front end, there's a lot of complex engineering that takes place. And I think that's very satisfactory uh, aspect of that and obviously because we work we're a, an agile system integrator so we all love working agile it's the only way to work and deliver software at, at velocity with the most value to the customer um, it's got a lot of pace about it and so i like busy high velocity projects who doesn't um, it's 
it's it's it's interesting and of course we generally have attracted and brought along um some you know of the best gcp engineers in this country um and you can learn and work alongside those and certainly when i started as broker you know I, I worked alongside some some incredibly talented people um and that's how you learn uh you know and for engineers it's uh, we have a i mean certainly in as broker we have a uh, an approach where nobody struggles if you're struggling for like more than two hours you reach out we have our own version of you know stack overflow to a data overflow or a devs off, off uh, overflow you reach out somebody in this building and other buildings um, will have an answer to it and if they don't have an answer to it we can tap straight into google and get an answer to things and i think that's the whole point of there's a nice community to it you're not isolated on projects um, because some of it is new. I mean, you know, some of this stuff when it comes GA, you know, and we're and we're not part of the alpha programs, but sometimes no, normally we alpha program everything that's coming out of uh, Google. Then, you know, it's a it's 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 a it's a good community spirit, and we're all trying to deliver a, a project. So I think, I, th I suppose, in that sense, um, that's what I would uh, think is the most attractive part of it. And obviously, you know, you get to be part of some quite cool projects depending on how sad and excitable you get about these things but you know i love all of these i love the end point of these projects well, well we're in tech you know, so you know everyone's listening they're in tech so they find they find it, it comes, interesting that's that this is this it is comes the, in, it comes thing, in very different formats but one in particular you know we had a we had a data room with eight 55 inch screens pumping in wall-to-wall -wall live analytics we love a piece of that <laughs> you know and that that kind of stuff is <laughs> is uh, tremendous. You know that that type of uh, project is great fun to be on. Other projects are available, but you know it's things like that is just the impact is incredible. You know, and uh, it's there to be done. You know, and and obviously, when when it on when it comes crunchy and they're getting a hundred times the traffic load, and it's all just scaling up and it's all handling it and it's still delivering it every thirty seconds, just pumping in live updates as it goes near real time. Nothing's ever real time. Uh, you know, it's really, really impressive. And, that, and that's, that's, that's the end game, isn't it? You know, where you've got these kind of applications or these solutions which can scale infinitely to a degree and, uh, you know, totally reliable. And that's, you know, what you want to build on, really. You want to build on frameworks that just aren't flaky, don't fall over. <laughs> and I've, thinking back to my OBM days, I, maybe I might have had a bit of that. <laughs> You know, I could just do without that hassle. I just want stuff to work and be quick. You know, that's what I want. You've actually also answered one of the questions I was oh. going to ask, uh, which is how much, which is, which is going to be, how much really hand-holding would you um, give your new starters, whoever joined you from whichever level of experience, because obviously entering, if you've not yeah. worked in GCP, this might, to some, it might be, a bit, okay, this is a completely new environment for me. Um, I'm completely in, in, in unknown, uncharted territory as far as I'm concerned. And you've, you've actually answered that quite well. I do want to ask, however, one thing which I'm, I think our listeners would like to hear. What are some of the challenges, those who are, you know, moving? And this might be, you know, it might be the same challenges going from AWS to Azure or Azure to AWS, you know, going on to GCP. What are some of the challenges your people who haven't worked with GCP before, they kind of face? So typically, uh, some of the typical challenges are obviously the product mapping you know, what's the equivalent of this from one cloud provider into GCP? What products should I use? And seemingly there are, say, four or five products which seem to do the same thing. What's the most appropriate? So that can become overwhelming. Uh, other cloud providers, maybe there's only one choice. Ultimately, there's only one product you could ever choose. In Google, there are some, choose, you know, there's some choices to be made. And I suppose that becomes more considered. You know, so a lot of our engineers tend to be very technical but also they can see that bigger picture so we have an idea as to what we're trying to achieve because you know obviously we're trying to build solutions that will survive and scale and live without having to be supported endlessly or we have to revisit it or we have to refactor it or you know those types of things we're trying to avoid because nobody wants tech debt so um, I suppose that aspect of it can be overwhelming but again we're lucky that we work in uh, disciplines so we have data discipline and app dev disciplines and BAs and, uh, and uh, DevOps. So you tend to kind of work within those disciplines and we have then the big crossover in the middle where you can then sort of get exposure to it. So you, you work in sort of limited product sets. We also buddy up, 
um, with various different sort of s disciplines and sections. So in your certainly when you're first starting out, um, and then uh, we shadow you in on a customer project. So you get used to it and you get used to all of that before you know uh, you ever kind of get into sort of into the world. And obviously we have internal t uh, TDA, so we use our own technical design authority. So if you do, you, for example, if you're an architect and you're coming up with a solution and you've mapped it out, you can book the TDA, we get our S experts on it, and then they'll give you an assessment as to have you considered this, this and this in a friendly, non-confrontational, visiting the headmaster way. It's a bit more kind of acceptable, you know, in terms of, you know, you can learn from that because there are people you know, in our organization with many, many years experience. So you could do that typical. Oh, they've got a thousand years experience between them, which sounds mad because there's just one very old person who's cryogenically frozen. It's not that, but it's more to do with that. Um, you know, you can learn a lot from going through that process. And again, um, it's all there for the help and the support. So it can be, you know, can be quite a good journey we've got a lot of reusable things we've got a shared knowledge libraries and all the other things you would expect but you could always then talk to uh you know anyone who who's there to help and i think i, I mean typically you put a problem out there somebody responds within a minute <laughs> you know because they're they're they they they're, oh, they just okay. naturally want to help people you know and uh and they like the challenge of it somebody's got a problem how could i do it how do i approach it you know what can i do what's the best way of doing it and obviously there's google recommended you know best practice which is well known, and that's something that we will always follow. Um, and then obviously there's the practical, we need to now work around this and make it work. And that's good old fashioned software engineering, which is what we, we all enjoy really. So you've told us so far, you've told us, we, we understand GCP is great, it's here to stay. Um, it's not going anywhere. The market share will not remain static for much for very much longer, and even the one percent increase—it's a huge yeah. increase given how much the market, how big the market really is. Um, but you've also told us uh, all those things now are aware how great AppSpark is as a company, the great culture, the journey you're on alongside GCP, and how great the people uh, you, all of you people in AppSpark are. So to give them a bit of a reward. As you know, as 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 a finale for this uh, for this episode, your guys are growing. You keep telling me that all the time. We're hiring. Yep. We're growing. What kind of role? So the listeners would want to know: Do they have a place for so, me? So this is a stop me and buy one list of people we we're looking for. Um, so uh, anything from business analysts, project managers, to uh, DevOps, to app dev, back enders, front end designers. Uh, data engineers, data science engineers, data analysts, and uh, data architects. Uh, we also need some um, uh, security specialists as well, because obviously InfoSec is a big part of that. So across the board, um, we're... So literally across yeah. the board, every, whatever you are, there could potentially be a place for you. At yeah, and, and, and in fairness, you, anyone who's a cross-skiller, uh, we'll consider as well and we, we're always interested in people who can who perhaps I suppose in other places might be called a generalist but people who can switch between so for example I've got data architects who also can uh, are quite uh, very strong on DevOps so um, that's perfectly fine you know so we carry in sort of some extra skill um, all of that's pretty useful as well and when you join in a discipline it's not prescribed for life you don't get like some data engineer tattoo and that's it. You know, you're, you're now, that's what you're going to be for the rest of your days. It's perfectly, you can traverse around different projects if you wanted to or different disciplines. And quite often we get people moving between uh, different skills because if there's demand for it and it's something that's interesting, you know, for you, uh, we can support that. So it's not always, you know, this idea that you come in and that's what you're going to be. It logically makes sense that if that's what you like doing, you're probably going to want to kind of do more of it. But if you haven't maybe seen that side of it, you might want to do a lot of, you know, infrastructure as code. You know, you might want to kind of do more ML ops, for example, you know, because you're interested in that aspect of it. Or you might want to get into some of the data science elements because everyone does because we've all got to have an AI ML project on the go. So, you know, all that. So it's um, it's very fluid in that sense. Um, so so so, yeah, so we're looking for lots of people. Um, and we're growing at a phenomenal rate. 
So uh, the demand at the moment is uh, is huge. So uh, again, we're we're looking to catch up and uh, you know get people on that journey, um, and you know go and go and win some business and go and do some amazing solutions for our customers. Exciting stuff! Exciting stuff! Well, you guys, you've you've heard it across the board. Whatever your background is in tech, whatever it is you do, reach out to Absroker. They're hiring right now. Matt, it's been brilliant having you today. Thank you very much, especially on a Friday afternoon. I won't take much longer of your time. I will allow you to enjoy, to enjoy the sunshine. Uh, you know, have, have, have a, an early kickstart to the weekend. Uh, thank you very much for joining us indeed. Thank you very much. It's been great having you. Take care. Cheers. Bye.